now? Yeah, everyone's in now. Okay. No my how am I? Thank you all for attending IHC's online forum. Um, I'm going to start with a karakia, whakataka te hau, ki te uru, whakataka te hau, ki te tonga. Kia mā kina kina, ki uta, kia mā taratara, ki tai. Hea i ake ana te atakura, he teo, he huka, he hauhu, tihei, maori ora. A very warm welcome to the Honourable uh, Minister Jane Tanetti um, from Labour, Erica Stanford from National, Tiano Tuiono from the Green Party, Tony Severin uh, standing in for Chris Bailey from the ACT Party, and Erica Harvey from New Zealand First. IHC is grateful for your commitment to disabled and neurodiverse students. Thank you. Welcome to the online audience. Um, we've had so many people interested in this event and more will be joining us as, as the hour progresses. Please, we have sign language interpreters, so just speak at a normal pace um, because we all want to hear what you have to say. So in the spirit of uh, the recent leaders' debates, I'm going to start off with a series of yes-no questions. So only a yes or a no will be allowed. Okay, so, and I'm going to go um, from uh, Labour, National, Green Party, uh, Act, and then New Zealand First. So, first question. Do you agree that the public education system does not work and causes harm to disabled and neurodiverse students and requires transformation? Yes or no, Labour? Yes. National? Yes. Green? Yes. Act? Yes. New Zealand First? Yes. Right, we're all in agreement. Thank you. Next question. Will you commit, your party commit, to working with all other political parties to build a public education system that works for all disabled and neurodiverse students? Labour? Yes. National? Yes. Green Party? Yes, is that a yes? Okay. Act Party? Yes. New Zealand First? Absolutely, yes. Great. Three, recent government rep reports have confirmed that the current resourcing system is rigid, inflexible and deficit focused, and the ongoing resourcing scheme is used to ration resources rather than meeting student needs. Will your party commit to a total overhaul of how schools are funded to meet the requirements of disabled and neurodiverse students and their schools? Yes or no, Labour? Yes. National. We are committed to learning more and understanding. Yes or no? Yes or no? What was the question again? Um, recent reports have confirmed that the funding system needs to change. Are you committed to ensuring that the funding system works for students in schools? Of course. Great. Green? Yes or yes. no? Uh, yes. Act? Yes. New Zealand first? Yes. Yeah, we're off to a great start. Four, will your party commit to effective teaching of all students by making the required changes to initial teacher education, professional development, and the support ne needed to teach the diversity of students in New Zealand's classroom labour? Yes. National? Yes. <laughs> Green party? Yes. Uh, yes. Act? Yes. New Zealand first? Yes. Okay. Five, will your party commit to ensuring that robust data on disabled and neurodiverse students in respect of the access to education, their achievement and well-being and their outcomes from education? Labour? Yes. National? Yes. <laughs> Green Party? Yes. Act? Yes. New Zealand First? Yes. Cool. Um, will your party implement the UN Disability Rights Recommendations on Inclusive Education, Labour? Yes. National? I don't know enough about it, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, Green Party? Yes. Act? Um, I'm not 100% sure on it either, sorry. No, no, okay. Um, no. Uh, Erica? Yes. Yes. 
Thank you. Thank you all for those um, yes, no questions. And I'll, I'll just say that the, the session is being recorded. And uh, <laughs> so thank you for your commitments. Um, we will um, we will now move to the section where I'm going to ask each party, you've got up to five minutes, I don't know whether you'll need that, but to, to describe your plans as a party, uh, your plans to make the system work for disabled and neurodiverse students. So I'm going to start off with um, Labour in the same order and um, move through. So up to five minutes and thank you for starting uh, Minister Tineti. Trish, I'm happy to start, but I'm just wondering, Erica, is that okay with you? Because I know you have to get away. And did you want to go first? Oh, it's okay. I've got a little bit longer. You can, okay. you can keep All good. All good. Thank you. Kia ora, kia ora, and thanks, Trish, for that. And thanks for the opportunity to be here. Look, Labour wants to build on the work that we've started through the High Needs Review to build on now the High Needs Change Programme. We're committed to implementing a new comprehensive fairer mm -hmm. Um, more student-centred, integrated and inclusive system of quality support in all schools. This is my passion. This is what has driven me into politics. Uh, I believe that we do need an absolute overhaul. I think a lot of you on this call have heard me say before that there's no such thing as tweaking around the edges. It is not going to change anything. And just pouring a whole lot of money into a broken system isn't going to fix that system either. So we will uh, be implementing the recommendations from the Highest Needs Change Programme that will enable students to achieve their potential at their local school, along with improved funding, because we do know that we have to have that as well, and workforce capacity. So we know that the new inclusive accessible system uh, has to be, has already been and has to continue to be informed by stakeholder input and includes the eight building blocks for change. Uh, I don't think I probably need to go through that here, but I'm sure you all know those eight building blocks for change. Uh, but it's basically it, it, the way that I explain it to people that don't understand the system well is putting that learner authentically at the centre and not just a cliche of saying it, but making certain that the young person is authentically at the centre and that their needs are being uh, met through this high needs change programme. It is really important that all of our other work in education is cognizant and inclusive of this high needs change program that everything must work around this. Um, we know that it's really important that the work that we're doing, for example, in the ministerial advisory group has to be inclusive of learning support staffing, and that is teaching and non-teaching staffing. And we need to look at the role of those uh, support uh, teacher assistants, teacher aides, support staff that are working within this area at all, making certain that we're looking at how we're professionalising that part of the sector, but ensuring that we've got the right numbers of people that are there. But we also need to make certain that uh, we're working with the whanau to consider the individual learners' needs and decide what works best for them. At the moment, we've got an application-based system that is not fit for purpose and actually is quite damaging in the way that it works for our young people. It is something that, as someone who has come out of the sector, I had great anxiety over, and it was not fit for purpose. And so that was one of the key recommendations that's come out of that high needs review, now the change programme, around looking at how we're making certain that every young person gets what they need to succeed and thrive within the system. Now, that is a big shift but it's an absolute necessary shift designed to empower students and their whānau to give them more, greater choice and control. The work itself has to reflect and give practical effect to Te Riti o Waitangi and Kahikatea Kahapaitia and the Pacific learners and families as outlined in the action plan for Pacific education. Um, just one of your questions there at the beginning, Trish, it has to be guided by the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability. That is just, there's, there's no question about that. And it must uphold the work of the Enabling Good Lives principles, and that needs to be front and centre. But it's got to look like that for education. 
we don't want to lift and shift and have really unintended consequences of the enabling good lives principles. We want to make certain that that is working for education. So there's a little bit of work to do there, and that's a little bit of work to do with the sector as well. But we do want to have it staged out so that we've got some immediate changes that are needed to be made, including professional learning and development for our teachers so that it is, I heard today, intentional and explicit to make certain that we're getting that intentional and explicit professional learning development and with the initial teacher educators as well. Uh, but we need that immediate change. We need two years. We need to make certain that we're staging it so that we're getting this absolutely right. But it is an iterative process that will work with the sector as we go through. Part of that, as you've probably seen in our manifesto is including the and continuing the rollout of the learning support coordinators who in the high needs review are called navigators but they are essentially really important part to this whole process um with I'm going to stop you there you've, you've had your five minutes but All thank you thank you I've got, I've got a question for you um, yes. there is some anxiety across the sector about the emphasis on students with high needs we want, are you confident that um, your change program will create the system that works for all uh, disabled and neurodiverse students, not just those with high needs? Yeah, absolutely, Trish. It's really important that it's inclusive of everybody. Um, that's a non-negotiable for me to make certain. I call it high needs, but I call it high needs because high needs looks different to everybody. And one person's needs, high needs are, you know, they might be considered low under the current system, but they are high needs. If they're not getting their needs met, then they are high needs. So it is a non-negotiable for me that it is inclusive of all learning support needs within the system. Thank you so much. Now we move on to the National Party. Thank you, Erica. Um, you have up to five minutes also. Thank you. I probably, look, I won't take that long. Um, I Thanks very much for having me here tonight. Look, we support, and I very much support, an inclusive education system that must work for all. But I think we currently all agree that it's not working uh, for all or for most of those uh, uh, neurodiverse uh, and disabled learners, uh, uh, not for the learners, not for also for their teachers or their families. Uh, it's not as inclusive as we'd, as we'd want. Uh, and many of those children that I see when I'm out uh, uh, visiting schools are not getting the specialist help that they need. Uh, and as I think we've all uh, talked about, the, the, the teachers are, are, are struggling because they're also not trained, and I'll come to that a bit later. Um, and what I'm seeing is children who are on wait lists, and the worst thing for a child uh, is to be on a wait list and not to get the help that they need. I've spent quite a bit of time uh, with, uh, uh, it's, oh, I've spent quite a bit of time in, in Mind Plus uh, uh, day uh, schools talking to uh, uh, neurodiverse learners and the experiences that they've had at school. Uh, and it's pretty confronting. Uh, and it seems like a lot, uh, there are, there's a lot of low hanging fruit actually that, that we can get done pretty quickly when I talk to those kids about their experiences and the things that would make their life better at school. Uh, look, we can have all these big reviews and talk about things, but actually they gave me a list of about 30 things that could be implemented in schools almost overnight that would make a huge difference to their learning. So I'm very interested in the things that we can do to make those uh, students' lives uh, uh, much, much better. Look, uh, overall, uh, I don't want to be someone, and look, if, if we are successful in a week, I mean, who knows, we'll wait and see the outcome of, of the election, but uh, certainly don't want to be someone who comes in and flips the table and, and starts everything all over again. There's been a lot of work that's already been done. But from my perspective, um, we've done a lot of reviews. Uh, the things that I'm really interested in are initial teacher education. How can we better equip our teachers for our neurodiverse and disabled learners? Because that's something that comes across very strongly. How do we intervene much, much earlier? I've spent quite a bit of time with ADHD and Autism New Zealand about early intervention, uh, uh, early diagnosis and early intervention so that uh, we can... Uh, uh, reduce the amount, uh, firstly, of assistance that needed, that's needed at school and uh, uh, make those uh, students' lives uh, a lot better. Um, I'm also very interested in what we can do around teacher, tra uh, teacher aid training. And I, I saw the uh, uh, 
the report out around teacher aid training. And it also, it's very important in this, uh, in this uh, work as well, because quite often what we are seeing is uh, our, our, our neurodiverse and disabled learners who are uh, assisted by teacher aides who have no formal training, although they're very wonderful, well-meaning parents, uh, they're not the specialist, not getting the specialist help that they need. So we are very interested in what we can do around teacher aid training to better support these learners. Um, I've spent quite a bit of time with the uh, Neurodiversity and Education Coalition. Uh, and I've read their white paper and they make some very interesting recommendations that we are very interested in. Um, it, 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 from my perspective, we need a really good neurodiversity peak body in education. I'm interested in neurodiversity plans in our schools. Um, and, and as I said earlier about some of that really low hanging fruit that we can do quite quickly uh, to make uh, those learners lives uh, so much better. Uh, at school. Um, and of course, you would have seen me talk quite a bit about structured literacy uh, and the science of reading and uh, how the brain learns uh, to read. Uh, spent quite a bit of time with those, uh, the, the Neurodiversity uh, Education Coalition talking about uh, structured literacy, and they're very excited uh, about the fact that we are uh, going to implement that in every school. Uh, um, as part of our, our policy uh, platform. So that just gives you a bit of a broad uh, uh, scope of the things that I've been noticing, interested in, uh, and, uh, but like I say, I think we're all in agreement that things aren't working. Too many kids on wait lists, too many kids not getting the support they need. Uh, and, uh, you know, if we are to have a, a truly inclusive system, we have to do something better. So I'm very interested to listen. Uh, and I want to just finish by saying that also very interested in making sure that we are working closely with the sector to learn what the, uh, you know, what some of the solutions are. Because one thing I know is that the solutions are not in Wellington and they don't sit with bureaucrats, they sit with you out in the sector. So I'm um, looking forward to having a, a good uh, relationship with you. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. It's really good to hear that um, you uh, are saying that um, there's no need for another review. We know enough information. We've got to get on with um, building a system that works for all. You've got some areas that you're interested in, in progressing and having a, look, a deeper look into, including in initial teacher education. Um, I, I've got a further question to ask you about how, how does that um, prioritisation align with your party's policy on mandated reading, writing and mathematics um, in respect of the support that disabled and neurodiverse students need, you know, in respect of their different uh, approaches to how they learn? Sure. Well, we know that structured literacy, for structured literacy, 95% of learners uh, learn to read using structured literacy. And uh, we want to make sure that the uh, structured literacy is aligned throughout the different tiers, tier one, tier two, and tier three. There's no point in having tier two and three a different approach. So we want to make sure there's consistency across uh, the, the, the different tiers. Of course, for the, that final 5%, there will be some learners who are uh, have you know, profound hearing difficulty or are, uh, are non-verbal, um, and that will require some different interventions. But for, we know the research shows that for 95% of structured literacy approach uh, is, is, is the best approach. And as long as we're aligning the different interventions, uh, we will get uh, the best outcomes for our, our disabled and neurodiverse learners. And did you say yes before to a, a new resourcing framework? Yeah, it's, it's, it's very yes. hard with you, no questions. <laughs> I know, I know. But I know, yeah. you back us into a corner. Uh, but but look, <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot more to say. Uh, but okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you so much. Now, moving right along to the Green Party. Welcome, Kia ora. And your five minutes starts now. Kia ora. Um, oh, kia ora. Sorry, I was, thought I was muted. Uh, tēnā koutou katoa. Kia ora, ngina, uh, tonga o te wā. Kia ora everybody. Um, <clears throat> First of, all, first of all, I want to acknowledge the questions, the quick questions that were asked in the beginning. For me, it it resonated with what I've been hearing when I've been going around talking around to teachers and and parents about um, uh, many of their concerns for for their tamariki. Um, and so, uh, yeah, the last two speakers talked about that we all recognise that the system isn't working and it needs to be restructured and and, and fixed. And I, I fully support that. Uh, yes, the high needs review needs to needs to get a move on, 
um, and that, that we need to make sure that our education system is as inclusive as it can be to make sure that all of our all of our children are able to have the best education that they can possibly have. And I also reflect on um, how the how the working conditions of our teachers, they're the learning conditions of our of our teachers too. And I and I and I and I heard you talk about uh, restructuring the way that the funding is as sorted as well. Something I would support as well, because when I've talked to principals and teachers, they've said, "Hey, you know what? I'm short of some money. I need to pay for some extra teachers' aid, but we've got to like move the budget around from somewhere else." When actually they shouldn't have to do that. That money should be, that there should be. Um, um, resourcing and that kind of thing already available to support our, our tamariki. So support what every um, what the what has been said before around more learning support about the about having more easier ways to access funding um, and just sort of acknowledging the frustration, absolute frustration that many of our parents feel when they're trying to trying to get that support for their tamariki. If I could just take a, a quick step outside of the school gate for a bit, there's a couple of things uh, that we as Greens have been advocating for on this campaign trail, which I think would be would support our disabled uh, disabled whanau and those people that love them. Um, <clears throat> so we've been talking about an income guarantee. Um, so that's uh, you know $385 whether you're in work or whether you're also a student as well. Uh, what we found with the People's Inquiry. Uh, in association with um, student unions was that two thirds of students were experiencing hardship and poverty. So we have a teacher shortage, uh, work at, work, uh, workforce shortage right across the right across the board. Why would they want to go to the tertiary education if they're going to be broke? We've got to make it easier so that we have more people coming through the system because teacher shortage is also a really, really important issue. The other thing there as well is that we know that many of our disabled whanau, they are more likely to experience poverty, more likely to experience poverty. And when you're poor, you can't afford all these other things. So making sure that there's enough money in the back pocket so people can put food on the table, keep the lights on, have a warm fight is so important um, <clears throat> for, uh, for them as well. The other thing that we want to do is also, uh, we under, we know that there's 1.4 million people that are renting in this, in this country and, and it's growing. So we've got to make sure that people have, um, no matter where they live, that their houses are warm, that their houses are healthy. Uh, and, and also, I think the state has a, has a role here to make sure um, when they're building houses, uh, that those houses are also accessible as well. And, that, and that's so important. And I, I, I really appreciated that you brought up some of the international agreements that we've, we've signed up to as well and the importance of how what we say internationally flows through to the action action on the ground. Um, uh, so, in terms of in terms of education, we are uh, committed to making sure that this is this is done well. Like everybody else, don't want a whole bunch of reviews. There's a lot of everybody knows that the the, the problems are massive, and sure, we don't want to uh, be wasteful with sp spending and money. That you know that makes sense for all of us. But my sense is that there is a generational underfund right across the system. And so more, there needs to be, uh, the government needs to be uh, bolder in terms of using those economic levers to make sure that there's enough resourcing in there so that everybody can have uh, the, uh, an inclusive education, that all of our tamariki and all of our students can have an uh, inclusive education. We've got to set that foundation. That foundation has to be strong. So that if you set the the new ORS um, categories, so that people can actually get the resourcing that they need, um, that there's actually resourcing resourcing there. Um, I might have maxed out my five minutes, but you, uh, yeah, you, you you're nearly there. But thank you so much. Yeah. Um, I've got a further question for you. Um, we all tend to think, um, all governments tend to think about the dollars that go into an education system, and we we're, we're very interested in outcomes data. You know, what does that investment mean for outcomes for disabled students and neurodiverse students? So I notice in the Green Party policy that you are committing to collecting outcomes data for Māori and Pacifica uh, students, but your policy is silent on, on um, the same issue, collecting outcomes data for disabled and neurodiverse students. So I, I wondered whether there was a reason for that or... Could you, you tell 
Um, I, I don't have the policy in, in front of us. It could be in another section. Uh, we've got a lot of a lot of pages, but if it's not there, I can. I'm, I'm more than happy to take that back and talk to folks as well. Because our yeah. policy suite is quite. It's it's bigger than most people's. Yeah. It, yes, it is. It is. And um, Olive, thank you for agreeing to take it back. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, can, yeah, I yeah. think across the children's and disability and education sectors, we're really we really notice, as you all probably have, um, the poor outcomes for for young people. You know, nearly fifty percent of them um, are not who leave school are not in um, employment, education, or training. So that's that that's a real shameful statistic for our education system. Thank you so much. Moving on to the ACT Party, Tony. Thanks for standing in. I've met with Chris, um, but I haven't met you, and I, I appreciate uh, your joining us. So could you begin now? You can talk for up to five minutes on your plans to build the system that works for all disabled and neurodiverse students. Thank you, Tris. Um, as you can guess, I'm not the spokesperson for education. However, I have a major passion in this area my, myself as someone with lived experience, as someone that got diagnosed at a late age of 21 with dyslexia, but going through my schooling years and uh, not knowing what was actually wrong with me. And um, the sad reality is I don't want to mention my age. I'm <laughs> of age. And nothing has changed for a lot of our kids today that we've still got a lot that are going falling through these cracks and they're not getting the assistance. Um, like the SPAL New Zealand was formed over 50 years ago to, to help our children that were falling through the cracks with neurodiversity, dyslexia, and they were hoping they weren't going to be around for 50 years, but they're still here today. So I'm glad to hear that there is a high needs review, that we have those information, that paper to be able to help our people with learning disabilities as well as the disabled. Because the thing is they're always gonna need a little bit of extra help, a little bit extra money. And always funding that we understand in applications that people have to apply for doesn't always follow. Um, I had an example of a 13 year old that uh, presented to us at the accessibility bill that her parents decided for her to get the better education was to take her to a private school. However, she still needed her assistance money there, but they couldn't get it to follow her, which is quite sad. So they've had to do this. And I'm thinking how many other of our children are falling through these cracks because of the shift. The biggest thing of all is we do need to get Wellington out of the way, especially the Minister of Education, and take it back to the schools, to the principals, and finding what they need. And this is the biggest thing is consult with the experienced school principals to advise on what assistance schools need from the ministry of what powers are best developed to the school directly, because this is that the school knows what they need better than us in Wellington. So they need to be, and also fundamentally shift of the functions of the ministry to enable greater school innovation and practices tailored to the school's community and maintaining accountability. Because the thing is, is that we can put all these things in place, but the schools have to be listened to because they're the ones that are going to be educating our children. And also the biggest thing that I also know is our training of our teachers hasn't grown with the time is around, around neurodiversity as well as our disabled. They haven't got the teachers that understand the needs of those children. And also I put this back, it's both Labour and National have failed us, who have had been the main two parties throughout the decades that we've fallen through the cracks, most of us that have those sort of learning, but also that intervention, like we talk about enabling good lives. So if we have that program where we are actually assessing each of these children's needs early on, and we know what their needs are, then we can see source the, that funding that's required and target the funding correctly, because there would be so much wasting that is occurred that we can redirect it to the right place that's required. Now, also, the biggest thing of all is that um, the stakeholders, and also we understand with some of the stakeholders that I've talked to over the years, have said that, you know, sometimes that they think that our, believe it or not, partnership schools was a good idea because you can set up schools around children's needs. And I always said when I was of um, 
age that if I ever won Lotto big, I would love to form a school that would help neurodiverse children because I saw how I failed. And also if we don't get them engaged as well as our children with the disabilities that our schools and also parents need to be able to shop around for the school with the teachers that have the ability to be able to teach those children because we know not all schools have the capability. I would love for all the schools to have the, all the same capabilities, but we know that is not possible. So the biggest thing is, again, enabling the parents, making sure our children are getting assessed properly, their needs, the funding going to the right areas, and parents being able to shop for mm -hmm the school that will meet their child's needs and also if we can get more schools that are like our partnership schools that we've had um, set up and for particular areas that would hopefully help um, in some of these areas that we're falling down and the biggest thing of all is their stakeholders is talking to the stakeholders I mean I've spoken because I have the disabilities role, but I hadn't been spoken to a lot around the education side. And this is that some of them feel like they don't have a voice and have been excluded because of many different oh, reasons. Your time is up. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. I appreciate your 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 thoughts. Now, I noticed that the ACT education policy, and I appreciate that you're not their spokesperson, but I'm wondering, you have mentioned charter schools. And I'm, I'm wondering what evidence um, sits behind your party policy that they will, that you believe they will benefit uh, disabled and neurodiverse students, because certainly the overseas evidence doesn't seem to indicate that. Can you comment on? Well, I can't comment. I don't have that data. Chris will most likely have that. So I can ask Chris about the data that they have on our charter schools. Uh, it depends on how they're formed and if they're formed with a community uh, based like a stakeholder. So it could be like with IHC or it could be with uh, New Zealand Sign Language. So if it's based around one of our organisations, I would say the success rate would be higher. But if it's just set up with no database and stakeholder engagement, then we probably wouldn't have a successful uh, rate. So that was that's my take on it. But the true data, I would say, would I'd have to find that for you. Yeah, okay, thank you. Because, you know, the research evidence is clear that they haven't worked well um, overseas. And in fact, disabled and neurodiverse students have, have um, you know, they have been the subject of a lot of policy experiments over the years. And I'm just, and I'm sure you, your party wouldn't want them to be the victims of yet another one. So I'm really, no. I'd be really great to see the evidence um, that you've based your policy on. Thank you. No now problem. On to the New Zealand First Party, Erica. Um, thank you for coming. Would you like to talk about New Zealand First um, plans in regard to building a system that works for all? And I know you've got a particular passion about this important work. Mm. Uh, first, thanks for inviting me to participate in this panel. Um, a bit of background for people who might be listening to this. Uh, I'm a mother of a child who has autism, so I understand the struggles that many of you face. And it's that journey that has led me here, which is why I feel very privileged to discuss the work I've been doing with New Zealand First. Um, if we're part of the next government, which we will be, uh, we'll know in a week, then these are the things that um, I'll be pushing for. Um, and nice to know that Erica and I seem to agree that things aren't working and have similarities around the areas of importance that need focus. So perhaps we could work together and explore some of these solutions I'd like to discuss with you on here further because they will require cross-party support. Um, the first one, we've looked at it by um, segmenting it. So the first one is how we could support schools. So our policy in 2020 was to deliver that final tranche and full tranche of learning support coordinators. Uh, since we weren't there to do this, it hasn't been done. It's something that we'd like to see completed in the next government. Um, this would help ensure that there's a funded role for someone to be dedicated to ensuring our students with additional learning needs have the support they need to succeed. Uh, we're also still interested in pursuing a conversation about another paraprofessional workforce called health aids um, funded for our high and complex students from the health budget to cater for those who don't have learning needs, but they do have medical needs um, where support is, is required. And that will also alleviate some teacher aid so that they can actually go and focus on other students that have learning, learning needs. The second thing is how we can better support families. 
um, from having discussions with schools and families and specialists. And Erica pointed on it as well. A huge issue we have are these wait lists. And then on top of that is the cost to have these children diagnosed so that they can be properly supported and also that parents can then be properly supported. And so that's why I'm happy to announce on this call that New Zealand First would like to fund pre-screening of students that meet the criteria for assessments of a disability, like dyslexia, autism, and other additional learning needs. And how we have thought about doing this would be exploring a partnership with SPELD or similar agencies who are currently able to diagnose and look at a, a way that we can actually use those um, organizations that are currently doing this work and then rolling them out so we can start to get more people diagnosed, more family supported, and we can start to do this quite early on. The third thing is how we can better support teachers. So we'd like, we'd also like to see better resourcing to train and educate current teachers and staff. Uh, and it's something that we believe should be funded by the Ministry of Education. Um, many of you will know uh, that what looks like bad behavior is a meltdown or is something that has triggered a student. And without this training and knowledge, many of these student, students experience um, unfair punitive measures like stand downs, exclusions. So we'd like to see these programs rolled out in schools, as well as added to the curriculum for new teachers going through teachers training. Um, fourth is how we can better support students and then also gathering data because that's super important. So I'll just touch on the legislation. So section 34 of the Education and Training Act 2020 says people who have special education needs, whether because of a disability or otherwise, should have the same rights to enroll and receive education as people who do not. However, what we know is that due to the inequitable funding model and due to the systematic issues in our education system, uh, many families are left with nowhere to go to resolve matters of attendance and discrimination. Uh, and this is why New Zealand First is currently exploring and would love to find cross-party agreement with um, you know, the National and ACT Party, whoever is in the next government, to allow us to get a uh, to, to fund and establish an independent disputes resolution agency. This will allow us to get an independent and overall view of what's happening inside schools, but will also give families a voice and ensure that they have proper support and an advocate with them while they're working through um, dealing with the school. A lot of times schools, um, being a chairperson, we have access to a lot of support when we're going through those procedures, but families do not have that same access to support. There is a similar model called iStudents, which is funded by the ministry, which is for foreign students. So a similar model like that, where we can make sure that if there are issues arising, that families are adequately supported to work with their schools for better outcomes. But at the same time, it will allow us to take data of what's coming in through this agency to see you know, what the trends are. So what's happening? What are the barriers to getting kids in school? Um, and so this is something I really feel needs to happen. And um, yeah, the only way we can really start to be better is to understand the data. And the data is pretty hard because you're pulling it from the Ministry of Education. Schools are supposed to you know, put that data as well. So I think an independent agency would give us a very clear picture of, of what's Thank going you. on. Thank you, Erica. I'm going to stop you now. And actually, that, that's been a policy position um, of various um, NGOs over time and and. Um, there has been a question submitted by Youth Law um, about uh, disputes resolution panels saying, yes, they're in the legislation, but there's a problem with implementation. We can come back to that later, but thank you for, for raising it. But Erica, I wanted to ask you another question. Um, the New Zealand First Party um, has a focus on enforcing compulsory uh, education and addressing truancy. Yeah, now, you know that many disabled and neurodiverse students have the opposite problem. They want to be at school, but right. often are, are unable through a variety of issues to not attend all day yeah. or all year. Um, I've heard of um, disabled students in secondary school um, going to school seven weeks less in the school in the whole school year because there aren't programs provided for them. What will your party do to make sure that every uh, disabled or neurodiverse student um, has the opportunity to be at school all day, all year? Yeah, well, I think this goes into how we're actually allocating the funding or how schools can actually take that funding to deliver a different model. The only model I have is the pilot program that we ran at Greerton Village School, which was um, a way that we've been able to figure out how you can, and I'm not sure if it's the right way to do it, but it's the way that we had to do it is to dovetail students. But I don't think any student should 
not be at school. And that's not obviously something that we would, you know, we want people to be at school. So it's trying to find out what the barriers are to get them to school. And if it's the school that's actually excluding them, like I've heard of uh, another candidate we have, his child isn't allowed, even though he's in a unit, he's not allowed to be at school when um, the mainstream's having exams. So it's looking at these types of things that are happening and then ensuring that they don't, because as we all know, every student deserves the right to an education and they deserve to stay there. So, I mean, it's a big focus on how we find out that it's going on, how it comes to us, and then actually how we implement to make sure that we take those barriers away because it shouldn't happen. Thank you. Now I'm gonna move on to the section uh, where we've received numerous questions from uh, students, families, teachers, other NGOs really interested in this issue of inclusive education. So we've sampled out a few and what I'm going to do is send you all the whole list of questions and if you could respond to those questions then we will post those the full questions and answers on our website and circulate them. So it's just good public information for people so thank you in advance for doing that. So I've got a question from a student who's 16 now. Um, IHC supported her and her family through an arbitration process for OARS funding. Um, she wasn't successful. She's gone through most of her schooling without OARS funding and she needed significant support. So her question is, why is it so hard for those without OARS to get help with their education during school and beyond? What happens next for those school leavers who don't meet the OARS criteria? Because as we know, it's a lifelong advantage or disadvantage um, if, if you are lucky enough to get OARS. So well, the way we're going to deal with these questions now, if you could just indicate with a hand raise whether you want to have comment or answer the question, you, you all may not want to answer all of these questions. So just raise a hand if you want to. Thank you, Jan. Yeah, um, very, very quickly, Trish, it goes back to what I was saying before. It came up a lot during the high needs review. We know that it's broken. We know that it's wrong. And so that therefore, that was one of the key pillars that came through that we need to partner with the learners and their whanau to consider the individual learners' needs and decide what would work best for them. And that's a shift away from this current application-based system because it simply isn't working for the needs. And I look, I'm the first in the sector to have said that it wasn't working. I think every candidate here would say exactly the same. And that's why we absolutely need to move away. Thank you. Anyone else want to comment on that, that question? Okay. That's fine. We're moving on now to um, a question from a parent um, who said, as a parent who has been through a human rights mediation complaint process against her child's school for an unjust exclusion as a result of no empathy or understanding around disability, how would your party hold the system and schools accountable for actions against disabled students? And do you recognise the need for a robust complaints process that is transparent and provides accountability? Who wants to uh, respond to that? Erica and then Tony. Yeah, so I agree. I think that's the biggest issue, which is why um, we were discussing kind of this independent agency is that um, when you complain to a school, it just goes to the principal, then it goes to the board. You actually don't have a lot of that support. So I actually think that the, the model needs to completely change so that students who feel that way actually are being supported and schools should help them walk through the process. Um, it is quite daunting when you're dealing with um, you know, child who, um, you know, has additional needs. And then you're also trying to navigate a system that you don't actually really know or understand how to get the best out of it. So I think we have mm -hmm. to look at how we can support that those families much easier. And at the same time, look at the reasons why the schools are doing that so that we can actually support the schools so that those barriers no longer exist. Thank you. And the recent ERO report, Thriving at School, um, around disabled students notes that to parents, whānau need a lot more information, they need a lot more advocacy support, there needs to be a much fairer way to have conversations about difficulties. Um, Jan, then, then Tony. 
Um, yeah, I agree. Like this, it's said in the legislation, we put it in the 2020 uh, Act and it needs to be acted upon now. Um, it is a budget constraint and that is getting the money and the funding, but I see it as a priority and that's why I've already said that this would be one of my priorities going into a new term is to get this uh, independent panel in disputes resolution in place because it has to happen. I've been there too many times supporting mm -hmm. kids, particularly at secondary in this. It's simply got to change. Thank you so much. Tony. Uh, this is what we've been talking about, the barriers for our disabled. And the thing is, is that, as you know, that a lot of parents don't understand um, what they're entitled to and what their children are entitled to. And if they've got no one that they feel that they can approach and talk to, I would hope that also not just um, education would have that disputes, but it also would fall into the Ministry of Disability as well, because they need to work together because these barriers are not only just going to be happening at school, they're going to be happening in other locations as well. But we definitely need somewhere where they can complain and it's held in one big umbrella rather than so many different organizations thank you so much yeah, i can support that that as well i've actually had probably like with all the other mps and candidates people with similar issues um approach me approach me as well so making sure that that is designed in a way to support our families would be a good thing yeah, cool. Okay, now we've got a question from um, teachers or, or the union representing them, um, which says, um, will your party commit to ensuring Ministry of Education learning support specialists, such as speech language therapists, early intervention teachers, teachers of the deaf and psychologists who work directly with students in schools and ECE services will be considered frontline staff and not impacted by any back office cost savings required from the Ministry of Education. It's a shame that um, Erica has left because that would have been a good question. Well, it's a good question for all of you. Thank you, Jan. You want to respond to that? Look, absolutely. And we've already said that. We know that we've got um, cost pressure savings that are coming from the public service, but we've said that that is a not non-negotiable. We will not touch learning support whatsoever. They are frontline. I have seen when that has happened in the past that they have been considered as part of the back room and they have there's been a funding freeze and it completely decimated the support that was needed for those young people. So that's an absolute non-negotiable. They are frontline workers and their jobs are protected. Thank you. Anyone else want to comment? Yes, um, I, I agree with Jan. They, they are frontline staff as well. And I, I am concerned about that rhetoric around cutting back the back room bloat or whatever National wants to, what, wants to call it. We're talking about people's jobs. And if those jobs go, who is going to do the work, you know? And and as as the teachers themselves said, we're talking about uh, speech therapists, we're talking about psychologists, we're talking about all these these people that do this who do this important work. And mm -hmm. and on October the fourteenth, they're all on the chopping board. That's not good for any of us. That's not good for the system. Um, and so, yeah, thank you for that question. Or Tamariki, yeah, thank you. And Erica. Yeah, but for me, it doesn't make sense at all because we're already short staffed in the in those roles. They should definitely be frontline. I can't tell you the last time my daughter saw an actual speech and language therapist um, because we can't access them. So mm -hmm. I think their roles are not only important, but we have to look at how we can grow that sector, protect them, pay them adequately and ensure that indeed they are in the front line. They're, they're so important to our education system. Thank you. Thank you all. Now, um, there's a question from another NGO from the Inclusive Education Action Group, and it is about, will your party ensure that the Ministry of Education works with Faikaha, the Ministry of Disabled People, to achieve a joined up across government response to the circumstances of disabled students and neurodiverse students? Thank you. Um, Tony. Uh, yes, that's what I would love to see because I feel that if we don't have that inclusiveness with 
Kaha and education and the other services a lot of our disability need to access, then they just keep falling through the cracks. And because navigating the different departments is still hard, even when the departments have a um, mandate of how to communicate to people and they don't even follow follow that. So if uh, if we can't join our, those important areas together, then we're not going to be helping our people. Yes, and as well as that, you know, Fano have been saying for decades now, we have to keep telling our story to a, a number of different government agencies and wouldn't it be great if we could have a joined up response. So moving on to you, Jan, and then Erica. Yeah, and again, it came through with the High Needs Review. Faikaha have been integral into the development of the next stage and uh, will continue to be so. And can I also tell you that, um, much to my, my horror in some respects, but that's a bit tongue-in-cheek, that Faikaha have got many of the Ministry of Education staff with lived experience working for them now. Um, and so, therefore, there's this natural joined-up response that's happening because of that. And I think that's a good thing. And I know know that all of the meetings that I've had with officials around this, we've had Faikaha sitting there at the table, and that's the aim, to get that joined up response. Thank you. Erica? Yeah, I, I was actually going to say the exact same thing um, Jan was saying, which is that, that if you've got, if we're looking at um, special education or how we roll out better with additional learning needs, disability and education should be working together. It doesn't make sense to me that it's not yet. Um, so that is definitely um, quite important. And I would love to see that actually happen. Yeah, and you'll know that um, Fakaha promotes the Enabling Good Lives principles, and one of yeah. the important principles is manner enhancing. And what always strikes me is that. Um, there is nothing dignified or manner enhancing about having to beg for resources and having families getting so desperate that they're faced with awful choices about what happens um, for them well, and, their, and, and their whanau so, and their tamariki. So, you know, that round support is, is so important. Now, look, we're, we're, we've got time for one more question. And um, I'm going to ask a question from another NGO, the Rare Disorders Group. Um, and you've touched on some things that they're raising, Tony, about, well, I think Erica, actually. How, how do you plan on ensuring that children with combined high health needs and disabilities are better supported in the education system than the current situation where they fall through the gaps between high health needs funding and ORS funding? So, um, Erica, you're ready to roll on that one? I'll just, yeah, reiterate the, um, yeah, so that's, I think, where that paraprofessional workforce, the health aides, uh, funded for, you know, high complex uh, students, those who have medical needs coming out of the health budget uh, to cater for those students. Um, you know, it doesn't make sense to me that we don't have these in place considering we've got, you know, you've got children with diabetes and it's things like this where they actually need someone that has a background in health. Um, and also, as I said before, it will free up then those learning support, you know, um, teacher aides to, you know, focus on other children by bringing in these health aides. Thank you, Erica. And now back to you, Jan. Yeah, I was just going to say that, that, again, that goes back to what we've been talking about is making certain that we're continuing to work to break down the silos. And there's no mm. more important space than this space for that to happen because we're talking about an all of life approach. And that's where the enabling good lives come in. I think Faikaha, if we just go back to that previous question, Faikaha mm. are really, really integral in this space to make certain that all of that young person's life is taken into account and that people have that complete understanding. It's going back to that principle of putting that young person authentically at the center and making certain that the design is inclusive of their health needs, their learning needs, um, that health is right there at the table as well. Oh, and Erica, is that just, there was one thing I wanted to say, which is that we have to look at education as an investment, not a cost. And mm. by putting money and looking at where we're doing the funding model, that's an investment into these kids to ensure that they actually live good lives. They don't fall through the cracks. And so that is something that I think we all need to focus on is making sure it's an investment, not an expense. Okay, just on that note, this is a delicious segue to my final <laughs> question, which is, which is, do, would your party support an increase to the total vote education, given that we need to invest differently? And if so, 
what have you got thoughts about how that increased uh, investment or increased vote education dollar value should be allocated? Big question, I know, but given the harm that's been caused by a broken system for over three decades now, mm. we should allocate some of this funding. Jen. Um, look, I was just going to say yes, and that's already we've already said that in the work that we're doing, that it's in, in the high needs, it's about an increase in investment as well, and that's what the next stage is. I mean, I'm not going to say it needs to go here, here, and here, but we know that we've got to get this right for our young people, and that's the stage that is being worked through with officials at the moment, but I will go back to say that it needs to be in um, conjunction with the sector because the sector is going to have some really strong opinions on this and <laughs> rightly so. So, no, thank right, you. Trish, Trish, I know that you have strong opinions on this. So, <laughs> <laughs> thank <rightly> you. So. <laughs> yes, um, moving on to you, Tiano. Um, yeah, the, the, this is a very, very good question because the, you know, the under underfunding has been, it feels like generational. Uh, and, you know, for us in the Greens, we're not afraid to pull those big levers. Uh, if you look across the world, particularly in the OECD, we're the only country that doesn't have a capital gains tax, a wealth tax or stamp duty uh, or a combination of those three things. Um, so the, our tax system is not fit for purpose. From our perspective, we need to have a fairer tax system so that you can get enough of this, uh, the, this funding and resourcing in to pay for all, all uh, pay for all of these things. This is what they're doing in, in the other OECD countries, the countries we like to compare ourselves with. So yeah, the Greens are not afraid to pull those pull those levers. And I, I, I do support that there should be an increase in vote education because it, it, it is an investment into our tamariki and our mokopona, and it's so important. Mm. Talking about Tamariki, one of my kids is singing in the background. <laughs> and Erica, we've got about one minute left, and I'm going to finish with a karakia. Cool. Uh, yep, so I agree we need to see an increase. Um, I think, like Jan says, we have to work with the sector. We have to figure out the best way that we can allocate the funding so it's making an impact instead of just throwing money into mm -hmm you know, a whole, we're actually knowing that it can make an impact and actually deliver, um, you know, some quality good policies and outcomes for our students. And I'll be quiet now. Look, thank you. Look, I just want to, before I finish formally, I want to thank all of you for attending this forum. It's been such a fantastic um, opportunity for, for families, for students, for all stakeholders to, to be able to hear from you all. Um, it's Friday night. Um, please go <laughs> relax now. I know you're all incredibly busy and we do appreciate the, you work, the work that you do as politicians. And it's, um, we, we are so pleased that you want to listen to us because the solutions will be found in hearing each other and working together. So um, kia ora and thank you. So I'm going to close now. Kia whakaeria te tapu. Kia wātia ai te ara, kia tūruki whakataha ai, kia tūruki whakataha ai, haume, haume, huie, taikie. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank Hilda. you. Bye. Bye, Jan. Have a great Friday night, everybody. Kāngi dē. <laughs> you too.